everyone thank you for uh, coming to the presentation today uh, it is my privilege to introduce uh, professor dilip soman um, who is the canada chair uh, at the behavioral eco lab equivalent at rotman school at the university of toronto uh, dilip soman is a very well published author in the area of uh, behavioral science in general uh, one of my earliest memories post phd is of looking at some of his papers but, uh, with john gorwell in the area of pricing behavioral pricing which is uh, one of the things that i teach a lot and have dabbled in uh, to some extent in research uh Dilip has been at at uh, rotmans for about 18 years um, and he continues to work in the general area of uh, behavioral science but now he also does in the area of choice architecture with a specific some specific work also uh, in the implications of choice architecture for policy uh, which is something that a lot of us are interested in uh, over here uh, dilip while you are here i think you should be able to see arun also on the screen arun shri kumar arun shri kumar has just joined us from the university of illinois at urbana champaign uh, he also does a fair amount of work in the policy related areas and we also have uh, richa uh, richa nigam who is our, uh, our research lab in charge she's got a phd uh, in uh, cognitive psychology from the center for behavior and cognitive sciences so guys i am just going to uh, leave the floor open to uh, professor soman and uh, over to him so we are looking forward to a very interesting talk for about 40 45 minutes and uh, then it, the floor will be open for q and a uh, some of you may also know that dilip soman is actually on our ed editorial advisory board of vikalpa uh, so dilip i think the editor of uh, vikalpa is also over here so you should say hello to him which is raman abraman uh, sort of hello that would probably uh, twist your ears during and after the talk today perfect um over to you dilip all right Th thank you so very much arvin i'm i'm very used to people at ima twisting my ears so uh, this is all good as you said pgp 1992 uh and especially fond memories of marketing because uh you know, I, I noticed one of your chairs is endowed with Professor Vora's name. And of course, he was a legend. And I have really strong and fond memories of Professor Vora, Professor Jain. Uh, and then after that, uh, I was taught by Professor Koshi as well. So um, re really, really, really strong association, strong memories. So it's a delight to be here. Um, as as uh, Professor Sai was saying, uh, I started off uh, after my PhD, doing sort of very traditional marketing work, I had done work in the area of pricing and services. And then at some point in time, I remember actually being in a committee meeting at the University of Toronto. This was shortly after I had been promoted to full. And so, you know, you as, as part of that, you get to serve on university committees. And um, the committee that I was on was about impact. Uh, how do we as a university improve the impact that our research has on the community and the country. And I was in a room with an astrophysicist and with a medical scientist. And this was a person who had actually discovered uh, the, a successful method to deliver uh, insulin. Um, there was somebody who had innovated in AI. And here I was saying, well, you know, my research is about uh, price perception and so on and so forth. So uh, that was kind of a tipping point for me. And I said, uh, and as Professor Sai will know, there's a lot of interesting work in marketing that has implications for society. So, I, so th that's sort of how I got started on the journey of trying to understand impact beyond business and trying to see uh, if we can improve the quality of lives. I did a number of studies back in India, actually, uh, in 2007 to 2012, helping people in villages save more and uh, engage in more hygienic habits and so on and so forth. So uh, that, that was the early work. And then I spent about a year and a half on leave from the university working for the Canadian government uh, in their newly set up behavioral insights unit at that point in time. And so uh, I've been actually spending all of my time on uh, choice architecture and, uh, and, and using behavioral science to improve uh, social impact. So today I want to spend the time on talking about one concept that I'm particularly interested in nowadays on scaling choice architecture interventions. And I'll quickly get to what I mean by that 
Uh, I want to share examples from two or three studies. Uh, given that we have only about 40, 45 minutes, I'm going to keep today's remarks at a relatively higher level. Uh, but those of you who are interested in learning more about the actual methods or what were the p-values or what did the model look like, please do reach out to me and I'm happy to share uh, papers and slides for those of you who are interested in, uh, in, in learning more. So uh, I want to just very really quickly start off with some uh, acknowledgements. Uh, I, I'll speak today about two sets of projects. I'm going to call them the South Korea project. This was done uh, in collaboration uh, with professors Kim, Choi, and Yoon, uh, one of them at uh, IE Business School in Spain and the other two at Yonsei University. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the Mexico project. Uh, and this was work done in Mexico on pension contributions. Uh, this was done uh, with two of my colleagues, Avnisha and Matt Osborne, as well as uh, two colleagues from an organization called Ideas 42. It's a New York based not for profit that does a fair bit of work in this space, uh, Elisa and Jacqueline. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, some of my other colleagues, Tanjim Hossein, with whom I wrote a paper, uh, Hossein and Soma 2020. That's going to be the basis of much of today's remarks. Um, Nina Majar, uh, Nina and I have a book coming out uh, in 2022 called Behavioral Science in the Wild, which builds on some of these ideas uh, today. Uh, and Catherine Young, who is a professor at uh, the Chinese University of uh, Hong Kong, uh, uh, who has also contributed to this work. So let me just jump right in, um, just in, in terms of logistics, uh, because there's so much going on on my screen. If you do have a question that needs a clarification, please do just unmute and jump in, because uh, I may not be able to keep track of everything that's going on. OK, so uh, very quickly, choice architecture, simple idea. Uh, that ch changes in context uh, change uh, change outcome, right? So, so we've known uh, from the research in psychology that we change the context, uh, people choose differently. Uh, so uh, Richard Taylor and Cass Sunstein originally in 2008 uh, wrote this book, Nudge. And then of course, there's a new version of Nudge that's just come out about a month ago, uh, the final edition, uh, where they make the point that now that we know that context or changes in context change outcomes, can we create context to steer people towards the kind of outcomes that we want to move them to? And so uh, obviously that's one way of doing it. There are other ways of, of changing behavior. So for example, uh, you know, we could do the standard marketing stuff, persuasion, advertising, giving people more information, uh, or as policymakers, something we are familiar with uh, restrictions, right? Laws that ban certain things or making it difficult to access certain products and services. Um, it's been shown uh, not just in the, in the book Nudge, but by lots of research that followed it, uh, that choice architecture turns out to be a relatively inexpensive, a relatively subtle way uh, of influencing behavior. And there's, there's lots of examples of how this is done. So uh, changing a default, right? So what's a default? Uh, it is what happens when people choose not to make an active choice, right? So in one example, um, I was looking at this problem, which I know is a problem in India as well. Uh, the idea that not too many people go and see their doctor for an annual checkup. And we know this is an important thing because if you get an annual checkup, we can spot diseases before they become problems. Uh, it saves, you know, it's obviously good for health, but it saves money to the healthcare system. So why don't people go uh, to get their annual health checkup? Um, we looked at a sample in the United States. Uh, this was a group of people that had actually purchased an insurance product that entitled them to an annual health checkup. And only about 16 or 17 percent of those people actually got a checkup. Uh, and, and so the market research agency that was hired by the insurance company called uh, the other 83 percent, asked them questions about why they were not getting a checkup. And the most common answer they got was that they were busy. Um, if you think about it, um, you know, it takes 45 minutes for a doctor's appointment. Uh, maybe another hour to go to the doctor and come back, maybe two, three hours maximum. Uh, I find it hard to believe that people don't have three hours in an entire year to do something that is clearly good for them. And so uh, we did a, a, a little trial and in the trial, we actually randomly generated appointments 
uh, and gave people an appointment. So for example, if Arvind uh, had signed up and purchased the insurance product, he would get a letter saying, uh, you know, uh, dear Arvind, thank you for buying the product. I've set up a, a healthcare appointment for you with Dr. XYZ. It's on September the 30th. Uh, if you're not able to make it, please give us a call. So we changed the default, right? The default was initially you had to call to make an appointment. Now you had an appointment and you had to call to change it uh, or cancel it, right? Uh, and it turns out just by doing that, we were able to push that 16 or 17% up to about 66%. It's a huge jump, right? And, and I think it wasn't that people were busy. They just didn't want to phone. Uh, and we've seen examples of changing defaults in all kinds of domains, right? So I remember uh, when Dell started selling computers online, there was a quasi-experiment that someone did. If you start people with the baseline product, the, the very basic product, and ask people, you know, you have the option of adding a bigger screen or a faster processor or whatever else um, in one condition. In the other condition, you start with the fully uh, develop product, the best configuration, and people can say, oh, I don't want a big screen and I don't want the fastest processor, right? So changing the place where you start changes significantly how much people purchase, right? So, so we know defaults work. Um, we can change information presentation, uh, for example, gain or loss framing. So in one study that I did here in Canada, uh, we went to households to encourage them to purchase an energy efficient appliance. Uh, it's good for the environment. It's good for the electricity bills. Uh, in one condition, people were told door to door person knocking at the door, given the same brochure, they were told, uh, if you upgrade to this energy efficient appliance, you will save about $10 a month. Uh, in the second condition, they were told, if you fail to upgrade to the energy efficient appliance, you will lose uh, about 10 or $11 a month. So same information presented either as a potential gain versus a potential loss, significant difference. When it was a loss, people were much more likely to make the purchase. When it was, you will gain $11 a month, they were not as likely. So again, these are just some quick examples of how uh, choice architecture has been done. Now the big question, right? So I, I'd say we spent since the publication of Nudge, which was 2008, we've spent a lot of time documenting the fact that choice architecture interventions work. We've done this in, in a number of different scenarios. Um, what happens when we have a success? What happens when we take a successful pilot, a successful study, and try and scale it up to the entire population? Well, a few things happen, right? First thing, uh, John List, who's at the University of Chicago, uh, talks about a concept called voltage drop, right? The idea that once you scale up, the size of the effects that you get dramatically reduce, right? So for example, in my, uh, in the example of, of the health checkup, when I went from 16 or 17% to 66% in a pilot, if I did that statewide, the effects would be much smaller than that, right? And there's a lot of papers that recently talk about this notion of, of the voltage drop. Now, why does the voltage drop happen? Well, there's lots of reasons. One of the biggest reasons is uh, our expectations are wrong. And, and the reason why our expectations are inflated is because of something called publication bias, right? So uh, a really influential meta-analysis published last year by Stefano Della Vigna uh, and Liz Linos, where they compared um, the effect sizes of interventions that were published in journals versus interventions that were not and essentially showed that journals prefer to publish findings with large effect sizes. Right? So we, we actually don't see the failures. We don't see the small effect sizes. We don't see situations where the intervention didn't work. And so as a practitioner, when I'm reading the journals, I end up with a fairly uh, inflated set of expectations about what's gonna work and what's not. So that's one set of reasons. Right? The other set of reasons have to do with differences in the situation in which the original study or the original pilot was conducted and 
the one in which it's going to be scaled up. And I'm going to spend some time today on this particular phenomena, right? There could be two kinds of differences. Uh, difference number one is the population is different. This is our, our basic segmentation 101, right? Like stuff that works for one segment might not work for other segment. People in marketing know this for a period of time, not a, not a surprise, right? Um, but, the, but the second thing, which is the situation, right? The way in which the implementation details of the intervention, the you know, whether the message was delivered in the morning versus the evening, whether it was delivered on email versus text messaging, these little things that we think shouldn't matter uh, actually uh, play a big role. And I'm gonna share some examples of how they uh, did that. Now, before I get there, um, I just wanna take a very short journey through uh, some really influential uh, writers in, in psychology and behavioral science that have shaped my thinking about this problem. I'm gonna start with William James, uh, the American philosopher and psychologist uh, who wrote a number of influential papers and books uh, back in the early 1900s. Uh, but here's the, the central thesis. Uh, James was essentially making the point that behavior is a function of the relationship between an organism and its environment, right? And, and, and so um, I'm putting words in William James's mouth, but he was essentially saying that it is a mistake to treat individuals as a unit of analysis in psychology in behavioral science. We should in fact look at an individual environment combination, right? Uh, and, and the roots of a lot of the phenomena that we have discovered over the last five or 10 years go back to this basic, simple, profound understanding uh, from William James. Uh, we know people are different as a function of time of the day. We know people behave differently weekday versus weekend. Uh, we know they behave differently if they're on their own versus they're with other people. We know a lot of these contextual matters influence choice, right? And, and so um, there's a project that, that I'm working on. We have a paper coming out soon, which, is, which essentially makes the point that segmentation, the way we used to do it, was great uh, when we didn't have the ability to observe behavior. But now that we do, now that we can actually see what the behavior is, uh, we need to rethink the way we do segmentation. But again, the point is uh, we need to be aware of the fact that people's behavior changes as a function of time. So that's sort of early 1900s. We can fast forward to the middle 1900s, 1950. Um, this person pictured here is a, a Hungarian uh, psychologist uh, called Egon Brunswick. Uh, and Brunswick was talking about the fact that a lot, I mean, uh, you know, Brunswick is known for all kinds of things, but the one that I want to focus on uh, is the fact that we should be careful about how we interpret the results of lab experiments or field experiments. And in particular, we have to make sure that the context in which we collect the experimental data has to be the same as the context in which it's going to be interpreted, right? So uh, just some super quick, uh, quick examples. Um, one kind of representativeness that Brunswick always talked about was the design of the experiment itself, right? So uh, in, in, a, in a marketing setting, for example, when we do stuff like conjoint analysis or simple fully cross designs, um, we essentially treat each variable that we're trying to study as orthogonal or independent of the other one. So just to give you a trivial example, uh, price and quality, right? We say, okay, let's, let's think about uh, the effect of quality on purchasing decisions. Let's look at the effect of price. And so we construct a two by two or a four by four experiment, uh, low price, high price, low quality, high quality. Uh, and then we collect data and we interpret that uh, data through a conjoint type of framework to see what the part words are uh, of these different attributes. Um, Brunswick would have said, hang on, in the real world, you often do not see high quality and low price, right? That, that cell is perhaps not equally represented in the, in the real world. Uh, and so if you take your part word learnings from your conjoint study where you have assumed independence and apply them to a context in which there is no independence, uh, then in fact, you will uh, create some biased results, right? And, and, and so that, that, that's an important thing for me as well, because I think when I think about a lot of the work that we do in the field, uh, we try and create lab experiments based on that, but we assume orthogonality and that has to change, right? Uh, lots of other things that Brunswick talked about, uh, you know, whether you ask people easy questions or hard questions, 
will change the way in which they respond. Uh, probability versus frequency. I mean, we, we see this happening a lot in the COVID era. I was just this morning reading an article from, um, unfortunately, a reputed source in the United States, which were talking about the fact that in a particular city, 60% of all COVID cases uh, or hospitalizations were people that were fully vaccinated and using that to question whether vaccines work or not. Now, obviously, all of us that know Bayes' theorem know that uh, that's the wrong conditional probability to be looking at. Right? We shouldn't be looking at the, pro uh, the, the proportion of all hospitalizations that were previously vaccinated. We should be looking at the base rates, right? And, and my pushback was, well, in the extreme, if all of us are fully vaccinated, then obviously 100% of cases will be from people who are fully vaccinated. So anyway, uh, to cut all this short, I, I think what Br Brunswick was saying is our experiments, our studies aren't representative of the real world. And as a result of that, uh, we get a fair bit of systematic biases. Uh, and then the third thing I'm going to touch on, and then I'll just jump into some, uh, some studies, uh, is uh, Richard Taylor's book, uh, The uh, Mis Misbehaving, uh, that's his 2015 uh, book, where he talks about the fact that there are these things that he called SIFs, S-I-F, a supposedly irrelevant factor that affects economic decisions. And so physical features of the context, uh, if you ask people a question inside a store versus outside a store, you get different responses. Um, surface features of a task, the time of the day, uh, other things that people might be busy with, other people that are in the room when they answer questions, all of these things affect our decision-making, right? Uh, and so if I do a study in a, as a pilot, uh, and then I try and scale it, there is absolutely no guarantee that there will be the same SIFs in the original study as well as in the context. And so we need to be careful about uh, scaling. So uh, to put all of this together, um, here's the general narrative. This is the narrative in the paper and the books that I just that I spoke about. We, we know it's becoming popular to help citizens make better decisions through these large scale behavioral interventions. Uh, many of these interventions are based on obviously convergent published research. These could be lab studies or small scale trials. Um, do these interventions always work when scaled up? Um, the answer is no. Uh, there are three things that drive the no. One is the context dependence that I just spoke about. Uh, design features of the scaled up interventions that are different from the pilot uh, could cause secondary effects that flip the results. Um, Sometimes multiple interventions are tried together. I've been in so many meetings, uh, both in for-profit companies and governments where people will say, oh, you know, uh, one paper showed that A improves savings rates, B improves savings rates. Why don't we do A and B simultaneously and we'll do it together? Um, and it turns out sometimes they interact in complex ways and unpredictable ways and, 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 and more is not always better uh, in the world of behavioral interventions. Um, third thing, heterogeneity. Uh, this is again to a marketing audience, nothing new. Uh, different people are different, different situations are different. Um, it creates an opportunity. Uh, the, you know, we could actually think about a world in which we could customize interventions. Uh, and the bottom line is we have to be really careful in our work with practitioners and discourage the use of what I call off the shelf behaviors, right? Now, what is an off-the-shelf behavior? Um, practitioner has a particular behavioral problem. They're looking to increase organ donation rates or contributions to pensions. They say, well, who else has done some research in this area? They'll go read a paper and they'll, they'll take the intervention that worked somewhere else, take it off the shelf and apply it, right? Uh, and more often than not, it doesn't work. And I think the bottom line is just because an intervention worked in a particular context, in a particular country, is absolutely no guarantee that it's gonna work in a different context in a different country, right? So that's the point that I'm gonna uh, next talk about uh, in a series of examples. We, this is our, our little cartoon to illustrate the pitfalls of off-the-shelf solutions, but we know, uh, we, we know all of this already. Okay, so the three examples I'm gonna talk about. One, uh, credit, credit card transaction reminders. Uh, this was a study 
uh, based on data from South Korea in 2010. Uh, and then the other two are examples from Mexico. One is an intervention to make uh, pension statements more engaging uh, to motivate voluntary contributions in Mexico. And third, using text messages as implementation prompts, again, for the voluntary pension contribution idea. So let me start with South Korea, uh, and then I'll go to Mexico. Uh, story begins many years ago in the lab, uh, paper by Duncan Simester and Drajan Prelek in 2001, which showed something called the credit card effect. The idea that when people pay using a credit card, holding everything constant, uh, keeping liquidity available to anyone that needs it, uh, people tend to spend about 40% more uh, when they are using a credit card compared to using other forms of payment. Back then, of course, other forms included uh, basically cash and checks. Um, there's been a fair bit of research in this area. Now, now obviously, it's getting easier and easier to pay. Uh, but there's been a lot of work documenting something called the pain of payment, that there are some payment methods that actually feel painful. Um, so back in the days when we paid by cash, uh, you got paid by cash, and you had to now count off money and give it off to somebody. Uh, it, it was a very salient process. So people tended to remember how much they had spent a lot more easily, right? Um, today, you just tap, uh, you know, your e-wallet or a credit card or your phone. Uh, there is no memory of that past expense. And so the, uh, the, the, the research suggests that if people tend to pay with these sort of weak memory uh, payment mechanisms, they actually don't remember how much they have spent in the recent past, right? And because they have a weak trace for the memory, uh, they tend to overestimate how much money they have, okay? So in, in one study, for example, uh, published around the same time as the Simester and Prelex study, I did some research uh, where uh, I put people in situations where they were habitually paying by writing a check versus habitually paying by using a credit card, signing a counterfoil, which was the way we used to do it uh, back then. Uh, and then after that, they made decisions about spending on something else. And, and it turns out that people you know, who had habitually paid using a credit card were more likely to want to make that additional purchase confirming the credit card effect. Uh, but it was because they had forgotten how much they had spent, right? So when they were contemplating a new purchase, they were saying, uh, oh, how much have I spent on similar things in the recent past? And if I have a strong memory for those other things, which, by the way, if you write a check, you're actually writing out the amount in numbers and in words. And so it leaves a fairly strong, uh, a strong trace, right? So um, what's the solution to helping people who use credit cards? Well, give them feedback on how much they have actually spent, right? Uh, and so we actually did a series of experiments where every time you tap the credit card, it would quickly show up on the screen your most recent expenses. Just to remind people that, you know, it's not like you haven't spent money. Uh, here's the list of your recent expenses, right? And, and so providing people with that reminder actually reduced the credit card effect. It didn't go away completely, but it reduced it significantly, right? So, um, Back, back in 2010, 2012, we wrote a few papers sort of talking about the policy implications. How do we get people to facilitate a rehearsal? Uh, in Canada, for example, the government has been contemplating a guideline to all e-wallet companies or mobile payment companies that they must make recent spending accessible uh, when people are about to make a new purchase, right? So um, the, the idea that when you're making a purchase, you should remember that you have spent in the past. Now, to cut a long story short, uh, the, the government of South Korea read some of this research, uh, again, this was the pre-2010 research, uh, and decided that they would make it a law requiring all credit card companies to send a text message to confirm a transaction. All right, and, and, and if you go back and read the documents carefully, uh, which obviously I could not do because they were in Korean, uh, there were two goals of this. One obviously was fraud prevention. So just to confirm that it was you that had made the purchase, uh, but also to serve as a reminder for past expenses so that people do not overspend. So that was the stated policy objective, 
So here's what we did, right? Uh, this was a company that launched a reminder service in June 2010. Uh, we have data from one of the uh, leading credit card issuers, uh, and we divide the world pre June 2010 to post June 2010. Uh, June 2010 was when the service was launched. We compare in, in, one, in one particular study, and by the way, we have data on several other runs, so I'm just going to kind of give you the punchline from one particular uh, data set. Uh, those who did receive the message, by the way, back then it was opting in, so they opted in to receive the message versus those who did not sign up for the service. Um, subsequently, uh, the opt-in, opt-out, uh, opt-in has been replaced by opt-out, and we get similar patterns, right? So we did a difference in difference measure, uh, post versus pre, uh, with propensity score matching, obviously, because we could not randomly assign people uh, to different conditions, right? Uh, and again, this is where uh, those of you who are interested in learning more about the method that we use, let me know, I can send the paper, but here's the punchline, right? Uh, the punchline is that this intervention only worked for about 12% of the population. So sending these text messages to confirm transactions and to remind people of their transactions only reduce spending for 12%. The other 88%, not only did it not work, it actually backfired. They spent more. Okay. Now, again, let's, let's go back and think about why this is going on. So uh, the picture here shows what we thought would happen, right? So uh, transaction is sent to the mobile phone. This serves as an input into mental budgeting. So it reminds people, uh, it assumes that messages are read and processed, facilitates budgeting, people become more vigilant uh, that they have spent money in the past, uh, therefore it reduces spending, right? Uh, the way in which the original studies were done were different from the way in which this intervention was rolled out in South Korea. So first, right, in all the original studies, the reminder was provided on the same interface in which the purchasing was done. So if you were in a store and you were about to swipe a card or you just swiped a card, you would see the message of the reminder there and you had to dismiss it in order to complete the transaction, All right? Here, it was different. Here, here it came on the mobile phone, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, attention, sort of was obviously a challenge uh, in this case. It wasn't in the previous case because you could not easily dismiss the reminder. So um, what, what was happening here, uh, and we've got a bunch of uh, follow-up work that we're doing right now, is this notion of digital dependency, right? So uh, we spoke to people um, and they would say things like, oh, you know what, if I ever need that information, it's always on my phone, okay? And so what ended up happening was a lot of people actually did the opposite. They, knowing that their phone was tracking their expenses, they completely disengaged from keeping track of their own expenses and their own spending, right? And, and so we got the opposite effect, okay? Now, of course, in, in, in more recently, uh, we have some, uh, because now instead of just a text message, there's an app, and of course, we can look at open rates, but the, messages, right? Uh, but they're aware of the fact that their phone is tracking it. And, and by the way, this whole notion of digital dependency is, is interesting. It shows up in a number of other places. Uh, GPS, uh, we've got some research showing that ever since people have started using a GPS, their spatial cognition is now affected. They're not able to actually map things out uh, very easily or keeping track of bill payments. Now it's all automated. Uh, people don't remember how much they pay or when they pay uh, for various kinds of things. So, uh, so this was a classic example of a situation where the results actually flipped. We got heterogeneity, 12%, the, inter the intervention worked as intended, 88%, uh, it absolutely did not, right? Um, let me move on to, to Mexico. Uh, and before I move there, I'm just gonna quickly make a point here. Uh, the way in which we treat evidence in the behavioral sciences is very different from the way we treat evidence in any other science. So what I mean by that is, uh, let, let's look at physics, so let's look at biology, right? If I say, okay, look, yeah, I'm holding up a pen. Uh, if I drop the pen, 
what do you think is going to happen? Right? Most people are going to say, well, it's going to fall down. And they'd be correct. Okay? Uh, it doesn't matter whether I hold the pen up in Canada or Ahmedabad. It doesn't matter if, I, if the pen is green or blue. It's always going to fall down. Right? It's always going to fall down. Uh, and, uh, well, maybe not always. If I took the pen to the moon and I released it, it's not going to fall down. It might, it might float, right? Um, and so the issue is every finding in science, be it the pure sciences or social sciences, is conditioned on a context. In physics, in biology, the context windows are pretty broad, right? Like, you know, the laws of gravity work to make the same prediction on Earth, no matter where on Earth. Uh, but in the social sciences, our, our, our context windows are very small, they're short, right? So like I say, supposedly irrelevant things matter. And that's why it's really important to conduct what we call in situ evidence collection, right? Always collect evidence in the context in which you're going to deploy the intervention, because any other intervention, any other evidence is, is great for a starting point but it doesn't really guarantee that it's gonna work, right? So having said that, let me sort of go now on to Mexico and tell you the story of uh, some of the work we did there. Uh, th this was in the domain of pensions. Uh, Mexican system is very interesting. Uh, I have seen many, many, many pension systems, uh, including the ones in India. Uh, and I have to tell you, the Mexican system is perhaps the most complex pension system I have ever seen. In fact, it is the most complex any system uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, citizens choose a retirement company first. There's a list of companies over here. There's about 11 to 12 of them. Uh, then they make a mandatory contribution equal to about 6.5% of their salary. That goes through automatic deduction as, as it does in most other places. Uh, but Government of Mexico figures show that people need to make an additional five to five and a half percent voluntary contributions to be able to retire comfortably. Right now, every time we speak about this, my first impulse is if we know this, why not increase the mandatory to 11 percent or 11 and a half percent? Right. And it seems like a simple enough solution. Uh, I remember speaking to this, uh, uh, you know, to, to one of the people that runs CONSAR, which is the uh, pension authority in Mexico. And they looked at me and said, well, have you ever tried changing anything in Mexico legally, right? And, and, and I got the point, right? It, it's, it's a really hard thing. It's politically sensitive, all kinds of things. And so, but the, but the point is people need to make significant amounts of uh, of uh, voluntary contributions, right? Now, let's just focus for a minute on this, right? Uh, how, do, how do people choose a retirement company, uh, a fund company to begin with? So uh, every quarter, everyone gets a statement. And in that statement, you see this table, the one on the left-hand side, okay? List of funds along with their performance over the most recent six months. 9.46, 9.36. A couple of interesting things that jump out uh, from the data that when we looked at it. Firstly, um, the funds in the top half of performance are typically always in the top half. The funds in the bottom half are typically always in the bottom half. That's over a four-year window, all right? And so somebody can look and say, well, if this is the case, why do people in it even invest in any of these funds? Right? Like I know that... Uh, for example, Imbursa uh, has the lowest rate of return. It's about 5% compared to Sura, which is 9.46%. And I also know that over time, Imbursa has had a poor rate of return compared to Sura. Uh, as an economist, you would say, why would anyone even invest in Imbursa? It turns out a lot of people invest in Imbursa, right? It's still a big mystery as to why people do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have a hypothesis which we're testing, which is that people tend to invest in a company that is headquartered in the district in which they live, right? Uh, so call it the geography bias or whatever you want to call it, but it's, it's my local, it's my neighborhood, it's my district fund, that's why we're going to invest in it. Right? So, so, so that's one interesting thing, right? Uh, second, this information comes every month, right? Third, the transaction or the switching costs are incredibly high. So if you want to switch from Imbursa to Sura, for example, what needs to happen in Mexico is you liquidate your entire pension amount, 
with Imbursa. You get an approval from CONSAR, and then you set up a new fund with Sura. So it's not as simple as just saying, okay, move all of my money from Imbursa to Sura. It's a cancellation, getting the money back, sending the money to Sura, opening up a new account, right? And, and so people, once they make a choice, essentially stay with the same pension company uh, throughout. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to skip this. Basically, retirement savings is a huge, it's a huge issue in Mexico. And we spend a lot of time kind of trying to understand how much it was. Uh, but here's the bottom line. This is the important stuff. Less than 0.3% of the 19 million active pension accounts contribute voluntarily. Right? That's almost like no one. Okay? So everybody sticks to the 6.5 mandatory. Almost no one makes an additional voluntary contribution. Uh, so we obviously, we, we did a fair bit of depth interviews about a few hundred people uh, across the country. Uh, we heard a number of things that we've heard in other countries. Right, A small contribution today won't make a big difference in the long run. Uh, a deposit doesn't feel like money gain, but rather like money lost. I don't know how to go through the process. It's too complicated, et cetera, et cetera. So, so fairly standard things. Here's one that we heard in Mexico that we haven't heard in many other places. I've heard something like this in Thailand. Uh, I want to have money easily accessible for my family now. Right? And, and a lot of times when you go to people in Mexico and it's the same in Thailand, and I suspect the same in India, uh, you will hear that saving for my retirement seems selfish because I'm taking away money for my family's present, right? Uh, and so that was an interesting insight because we hadn't heard that in the United States or Canada or the UK or Australia. So very quickly, just to kind of give you a high level uh, sense of what we did, this was the the pension statement that people used to get. It was printed in one color. It's like a standard you know, government form. Uh, you would get this every quarter. Um, there was a lot of information here. This was the table that I showed you before. Uh, your name, your very basic things there. Uh, this was your performance of your, of your fund. Um, and it turns out most people don't even look at this, at this document. Right? Uh, they don't look at it. It's, there's nothing new uh, in it. They don't really get a sense that there's any information in this document that will help them do anything differently. Uh, so we said, well, can we use this document to both motivate people to do something about it and then give them the right information? Right? And, and part of the challenge was this was an absolutely incredibly boring document. Like It's just like visually not appealing. Right? So the first thing we did was we uh, we made it appealing, right? So by the way, it's, a, it's an experiment with a total of about 1.27 lakh uh, respondents. Uh, but let me just show you the pictures because that's easier to follow. So, so this was the old one. Uh, this is the new one over here, right? Uh, so now you see it's got colors. Uh, it's got this on the top, okay? There's something that we call a thermometer, right? And the thermometer is uh, essentially a piece of feedback that compares what your pension uh, stock should be with what it is right now. So, you know, your standard financial planner, let's compute where we think the, uh, the fund is going and how much you should have at the age of retirement, which was 65 in Mexico. Uh, agreement, meant everything is fine, no problem. Uh, just do what you're doing. Uh, a yellow meant that you're almost there, some improvements, and you'll be able to meet all of your financial goals when you retire. An orange meant that you're a little bit behind uh, and you really need to do some work now in order to meet your retirement goals. A red meant, gosh, things are bad, right? Uh, and obviously, in the interest of ethics, we focused our studies on orange and yellow. We didn't want to look at people who were not doing well at all uh, or people for which this was not a problem. We did a few things. The first thing we did was uh, we, we, you know, obviously we, we played around with the colors. We focused on the family. There was no focus on the family there, as you, as you notice. Uh, we used visuals to highlight how money grows over time. Uh, we, in some cases, put in a little wallet card, which had more information, phone numbers, how to contribute, all of that stuff. Uh, basically, it was a lot more of a visually appealing document, right? Uh, some interventions, gain versus loss frame, okay? So in the gain frame, we said, okay, if you set aside 9,900 pesos today, it's gonna to grow to 32,500 pesos, 
Okay, so that's what you gain over time. Loss is you could have got 32,500 pesos if you contributed to the fund, but instead you're only going to have 9,900 because you did not contribute to the fund, right? So same information presented uh, differently. That was one particular uh, manipulation that we had. A wallet card that I spoke about before, this kind of said how much you should ideally contribute, uh, when should you do it, and on what date. Uh, and on the back of the card, once you peeled it off, there were the, all the phone numbers and the account numbers that you needed uh, to, to make the contribution. The idea was to simply remind people uh, to actually do it. Um, then there was a little uh, family appeal visual. There was one in which uh, this was you in the future, uh, but if you contributed, this could be you in the future, all of you on the beach, which turns out beach is a big uh, a, a big social thing in, in Mexican life. Uh, and, and, and so we tried all these different interventions, gain frame, loss frame, wallet, family appeal. Uh, and let me just quickly show you the results. So I'm gonna focus for a minute on the left-hand side here. Uh, this is the contribution rate at firm with high engagement customers. What that means is a firm that has a high performance, right? So remember the list that I showed you, this was a firm that was in the top three. Okay, old statement, right? Uh, tracked over time. Uh, and then all these are the new ones gain, loss, family, wallet cut out, right? All of them outperform the old statement. Okay? Here's the interesting one uh, firm with low engagement customers, the ones that actually had a fund that was not performing that well, right? Uh, we get the opposite effect, right? They're not like hugely significant but it's a backfiring effect. Uh, now contributions actually went further down, all right? Uh, and we say, well, why is this going on? Well, in hindsight, it's an obvious reason why it's going on. Essentially the intervention increased engagement and increased attention to the information. If the information was good, that increased attention caused a greater contribution if the information was bad, then that information caused a reduction in contribution, right? And we've showed this now in a number of different domains, right? Every piece of information that you give people has some good news and some bad news. If the news is good, then highlighting, making it salient, changes behavior in a positive way. If the news is bad, then highlighting information to that bad news changes information in a negative way, right? And so it's not as simple as, oh, these people improved salience of the information and that increased salience changed uh, people's behavior for the better. You have to be very careful about what news you are making more salient. Okay, one last study, and then I'll shut up and take time for questions. This was done with text messaging. Right? So what we did here was uh, we worked with one of the retirement companies in the bottom half of the performance chart, um, 97,000, almost a lakh uh, respondents. Uh, this was a study run in October to December 2016. Uh, this was text message reminders. Right? So this was independent of the previous study that I just showed you. Uh, in a control condition, no reminders. In uh, one condition, we just sent them the new statement but no reminders. In a third condition, there was a new statement plus a text message call to action treatment, right? And within the call to action treatments, we had different times. We had uh, basic alert, right? Uh, remember, it's time to make a contribution. Uh, something as simple as that. Uh, or a pennies a day uh, effect. So this was one of the earlier papers that uh, Arvind had spoken about before. Uh, presenting something as just a penny a day or a dollar a day or a rupee a day uh, makes it a lot more affordable than saying, well, that's 300 rupees or $300, right? So we just said, for just, for just a few pennies a day, you can actually improve your, your uh, retirement corpus, right? Fresh start, okay? Uh, research in psychology is showing that if you kind of tell people, okay, you know, you've not achieved anything now, but start now, let's make a start now. Uh, uh, it turns out that uh, that was another intervention we tried. We had an intervention, a message with individual goal, individual security, family goal, family security, all of that stuff, right? Uh, and as always, we measured the likelihood of contribution, how much people contributed, number of times they contributed. Um, let me just focus on one thing. I'm gonna focus on the control condition versus the family security condition, right? So this was a big effect, okay? Uh, focusing a text message on family security significantly increased contribution rates, 
Okay. Now, some of these other treatments had effects, but nothing, uh, nothing huge, right? And this goes back to the earlier interview work that I said, which showed that people really cared about the family appeal. So um, here's the interesting stuff. So I'm not gonna walk through this entire uh, slide here, but essentially we said, well, look, can we try and understand the heterogeneity in these effects? Can we try and figure out who did this message work most for? and who it didn't. Uh, and in order to do that, we use simple machine learning uh, approaches. The one we used uh, was called causal forest and causal trees. Uh, again, if those of you who are interested, uh, I can send you the paper so you can uh, see what we've done. There's actually a beautiful tutorial on causal trees uh, by Susan Athey and Jeff Imbens in that 2016 paper. Uh, but essentially it's a recursive clustering algorithm is, is what it is, right? Uh, and, and so we learned a few things uh, through through machine learning. So here's here's the one thing we learned, right? Uh, we learned that uh, if I just look at the percent of people making a contribution, uh, we learned that age mattered, okay? Uh, that if you were less than 27, then the intervention actually backfired. It did not work for you. Why? Because you didn't have a family, okay? So you're telling me it's important to save for your family. I don't have a family. Uh, so uh, people tend to save less, all right? In this age group, 28 to 42, uh, a, a fairly big and significant effect, right? Uh, that age group telling people that you should save for retirement because of your family had a significant effect, uh, a slightly smaller and less significant effect uh, at ages greater than 43. Now in hindsight, this is not surprising at all. Right, uh, but but let's think for a minute. Of, and, and by the way, we, we did this not just for age; we did this for gender. We had a few other observables, right? Uh, so we learned, for example, for gender, uh, these cutoffs were you know here here the cutoff was at age twenty seven uh, overall, uh, but for women the cutoff was was shorter; it was twenty five. For men, it was twenty nine. Right, and if you look at the data, it turns out you know on an average, uh, Mexican men get married at age twenty eight, twenty nine, and women get married at twenty four, twenty five. Right, and so it's it makes perfect sense in hindsight when you look back at it. Right, we were able to do it by rural versus urban. We were able to do it by other other factors as well. Right, um, but if I was sort of doing this traditionally as a marketing person, you know, uh, here's what I would have done. I would have said, I think age matters. Let me look at the census data. The census data will give me age in brackets. So it'll say things like less than 24, 24 to 36. Right, so I might need to run these multiple experiments in different age groups. It's costly, it's not efficient. Uh, plus who is to say that these cutoffs happen at the same cutoffs that the census slices age, right? So for example, 27 was not the way the census sliced the data. Uh, it was just what machine learning told us, right? Uh, and so what we're working on right now is to say, look, I know based on the result of my trial, which intervention works best for which group can I customize interventions as a function of uh, which group people are in, right? So we're doing this like not just with in Mexico, but in several other places and with, with one insurance company, uh, when people land up at their website, I can ask them a few basic questions. If they're registered customers, I already know something about them. Uh, and I can immediately run the algorithm. I can put them into the appropriate cluster. I can say, based on my trial, people in this cluster like this layout of the website. And so I can serve them that layout, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of these interesting things we can now do through customizing uh, interventions by learning about them through, through machine learning. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just quickly wrap up because I know we only have about seven or eight minutes. Uh, what are the implications of all of this choice architecture stuff for policy? Well, when context is key, right? Uh, I think that's the thing that we tend to keep missing. Uh, we often, at least in policy circles, we will borrow ideas, we will take them off the shelf. Uh, th that's why qualitative research is so important. That's why you got to go in and understand what the social context is. I remember doing some research in Thailand. Uh, Thailand is a lot like India, right? I, you know, we were doing some work uh, with an American colleague of mine on retirement savings. I remember interviewing a farmer and my colleague looked at him and said, you know, you don't have a single bar safe for retirement. Aren't you worried? And the farmer looked back and said, well, I have four sons. Why should I worry? Right. Um, and it's something you would hear in India. Right. But, but I think the point is we often tend to transport 
our beliefs about the socioeconomic uh, fabric of society onto other countries, and that's perhaps a big a big mistake. So it's really important to do qualitative research, right? Uh, small changes have big impacts, right? We we often spend a lot of time working on the big stuff, right? Do I have the program right? Have I you know, calculate, is it the right interest rate? Am I giving people the right amount of cash transfer? Yeah, I mean, those things are important, right? But it's really these little frictions uh, that seem to matter more. Is the communication simple and engaging? Is, is the information easy to understand? That sort of stuff, right? Uh, machine learning. I, I think uh, it, in, in both in Canada and a few other uh, jurisdictions that I've worked in, governments have a behavioral unit. They have a data unit. They don't speak to each other. Uh, and I think it's really important they do, because I think there's just so much to do at the intersection of, for example, in this case, machine learning uh, and, and behavioral science. Customization of interventions is possible. It should be encouraged. We're actually, like I say, the website example I gave, there's a few other things that we're working on. Uh, tax, for example, right? Like every year, uh, every government has some new tax regulations. We send out brochures to everyone. Uh, saying this year there are 20 new clauses in our tax laws and nobody reads those brochures. It's just too much information there. Uh, why not send only relevant information to relevant people based on an understanding of where people make mistakes on their tax returns, right? So we're doing a couple of pilots, uh, pilots on that. Uh, and at the end of all of this, we can actually quantify the, uh, the changes uh, and, and what effect they have to both firm and consumer well-being, right? So uh, in the paper, we talk about about sort of what are the benefits of simply making the statement more engaging on contribution rates, on profits, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and it's, it's a pretty significant amount. Like these small changes have, have pretty significant uh, impacts at the end. So um, I think there are four challenges in general when we take interventions to the field, right? First, the, the idea that I spoke about, the nature of evidence and behavioral science is different. Right? It's not as simple as doing a meta-analysis and saying, okay, it worked there, let's apply it, right? Uh, two, uh, I've seen this with companies, I've seen this in governments, solution-mindedness. Right? There is absolutely no time to do the science. It's, you know, let me just kind of get something out. Like governments are incentivized by how many programs they deploy. Uh, managers get rewarded on how many ideas they come up with, not on whether the idea was well thought out, right? So there's always a solution mindedness and the more solution minded you are, the less due diligence you will do. And I think that's, that's a cultural uh, challenge that we need to overcome. Um, third, over-reliance on frameworks, right? Uh, so on the behavioral sciences, for example, in an effort to make the science more popular, you've developed these sort of rule of thumb frameworks, East, like make it easy, make it timely, make it social, make it attractive, right? And it's good to communicate, but when people in the field only treat this as the basis of designing an intervention, we run into problems. That's when they ignore the context. That's when they ignore the socioeconomic factors, right? So I think we have to be careful about sort of driving these frameworks. Uh, as someone said, you know, things should, should be as simple as they need to be, but no more. Uh, and this is a classic example. And then the whole notion of silos of capability, right? I think there's a lot of uh, table stakes waiting to be had by simply merging our insights on behavioral science with machine learning, with design thinking. We don't do a whole lot of that. So uh, I, I could go on and on, uh, but given where we are on time, let me pause here. I know we only had time for another three or four minutes, but I'm around for the next little while in case people have questions. So uh, I will stop sharing and turn it back to Professor Ram. I'm muted, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, that was a extremely interesting talk and uh, I would rather the new guys have questions first. I mean, that would be, uh, so please, uh, it's not an opportunity that comes every day. So uh, yeah. Deep, I had a, I had two questions, but in the sure. interest of time, I'm going to ask both these questions together. So my first question is, do you think as researchers, uh, we have a, a context selection bias? That is, we select contexts where we think the intervention is most likely to work. And, and we do that inadvertently. For instance, if I were to uh, study the effect of information provision, then I would 
perhaps select a, a, a company which is very engaged with, with, its, uh, with consumers. Or if I were to study uh, the behavior of using credit card, I might do the study in the US than in India where there's more usage of debit cards. So that is my first question. And if there is that bias, then how do we correct it? Or how do we be mindful of it? Uh, my second question is, uh, what are the pressing problems of uh, the present and the near future that excite you the most as a marketing sure. researcher? Okay, so I'll start with the first one. So uh, the short answer is yes, right? Uh, we, we do. Um, it's, it's unfortunately a problem that is deeply rooted in our field and our incentive structures. Uh, you know, till the time we get to a world where our journals are willing to publish non-results or null results, we will always have this problem. Right. Uh, and uh, and so we're making a few changes. You know, we are launching uh, edited volume, for example, where we'll only publish null results uh, here at U of T. Right. Um, but but I think that's going to be a slow process. So we do do that. I think the other challenges and Nina and I talk about this in our in our book. Right. Is if you imagine like a matrix where on the rows you have sort of different behavioral phenomena, right? You talked about information presentation or I'm interested in mental accounting or whatever else. And on the columns, you have practical problems. How do I reduce crime and reduce poverty, right? Uh, the world is interested in the columns, right? The government wants to reduce poverty. They don't care about mental accounting. They don't care about information, right? Uh, we specialize on the rows. Uh, and I think that creates a fundamental problem in that we don't, we don't make the science for use by practitioners, right? And, and I think that's one of the big big nuts we, we have to crack. And I think unless we crack that, our, our science is going to be largely, unfortunately, irrelevant, right? So I think we have a wonderful behavioral science. We do not have a science of how to use the science. And I think that's what I'm sort of interested in, in, in developing, right? In terms of the practical you know, areas, I, to me, I think environment uh, and sustainability is a huge one. Uh, I think a lot of efforts have been spent on trying to get consumers to change behavior. I think the interesting stuff is in getting companies to change behavior, right? If if there's plastic in the packaging, then you know your the, the limits on what you can do are are already pretty low, right? Uh, so so I think we need to focus more on corporate behavior change. Um, diversity inclusion is the other big one. Uh, and my, my own interests are in, in poverty, right? Things like cash transfer programs or uh, basic income programs. Uh, so we've had a couple of good pilots here in Canada. Unfortunately, some of them have stalled, but I think to me, you know, poverty fundamentally changes the psychology of people. And we simply treat poverty as lack of money, but it's also lack of cognition. And I think, you know, that's an important sort of thing to recognize. So if we can give people enough money just that they can function properly cognitively, uh, I think that's one that's one less thing to worry about, right? So um, those are the things that I'm most passionate about. I would like to ask uh, two questions. Uh, so the first one is on the uh, regarding how sustainable are these interventions? So uh, if the, we actually do end up uh, finding a successful intervention. Is it actually going to be sustainable when there are multiple decisions to be taken? Or is it only when there is a one-off kind of decision? So that is one, because repetition, I think, reduces the effect of uh, sustainability of the intervention. Yes. So, so I, it's, it's a great question. I, and, and I think it's a question that sort of has one of these... Again, it depends on how you evolve the behavior change over time context. So let me just give you a quick example of something we did in India uh, 10, 15 years back, right? So this, this was in a group of villages in South Maharashtra where we essentially encouraged laborers, these were agricultural laborers, to save more simply by partitioning money, right? So, you know, like these people get cash in terms uh, and much as they want to save, they don't, right? It's sitting in their pockets or it's sitting under their mattress, right? And so we essentially just kind of created, you know, we took the cash incomes and we divided them up into different envelopes, like literally paper envelopes. And I just write things on it, things like this is your food money and this is your savings, this is your children's future and stuff like that. Worked really well right, in the short run. Uh, but then after a period of time, people got used to it. Okay, so then they started sort of cheating the system, right? They would say, oh, I'm, I'm going to spend money on this, but that's for my children's future because it's good food and, and good food, right? So over time, we had to start new interventions. So once we kind of got to a situation where 
about 10% of people in the village were saving a lot of money by these envelopes, right? Uh, we would designate some of them as like the savings ambassador, right? So let's say Arun, for example, became the savings ambassador. I'd give him like a little sticker and a badge and all of that stuff, right? Now that he was a savings ambassador, he couldn't very well not, not save because now everybody else was going to Arun for advice, right? Uh, so we use identity there, right? Uh, to to take that back to the question, I agree with you. I think people habituate very quickly to certain kinds of interventions, right? Oftentimes, the problem for long-term behavior change is a starting problem, right? It's like being on a diet, for example, right? If you do a diet successfully for two weeks, you can do it, right? It's the first two weeks that's always a challenge, uh, right? And, and so uh, gym, going to the gym, it's going to the gym, for the first time, that's a challenge for most people, right? And so those are the kinds of things where choice architecture interventions work really well, right? But if there are other things where people tend to fall off over time, then I think we have to now start thinking about other forms of behavior change techniques. I don't know if that answers your question, Priya, but uh, you're absolutely right. It's, you, we can't just kind of do it and we say we're done. Okay, and the other question was on the uh, on biases. Can we do something? So uh, typically, the, the solutions that you propose are a lot with regard to decision making, but there right. is also a lot of unconscious, uh, not exactly deci decisions, but biases that people have. So something like um, uh, race or skin, any of these. And this is uh, it's very persistent. So can we actually do something with uh, behavior architecture there? So we can, and I think one of the simple. Uh insights that a colleague of mine has is if we know that there is certain information that creates a bias, that creates stereotyping, for example, uh, and if that piece of information is not diagnostic to the decision that you're gonna make, hide it, right? So there's a company uh, uh, called Be Applied in the UK that specializes in recruitment services where they will essentially not accept resumes. You have to go in and answer questions and it will populate a resume that makes your identity blind, your language blind, or that sort of stuff, right? Uh, and it turns out it's amazing. It, it uh, increases the focus on the attributes that matter most. I mean, we've had examples of an orchestra in, in Europe uh, that basically got people to audition behind a screen instead of sitting in front of the maestro, uh, ended up you know, increasing diversity that way, right? So, so I do think it's possible to use some of these simple insights to say, well, look, let's just hide information that is not relevant. Uh, I think the other thing to think about is if we can actually somehow use these non-conscious uh, biases in, in a way in which, uh, you know, people learn their own mistakes over time. Right. So giving people feedback about some of the errors, I think, is helpful. One last thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up uh, on, on this, because I think this whole diversity thing is particularly important. Uh, we tend to focus a lot in organizations, for example, on hiring decisions, right? Like, do we hire people? Or, right? We don't focus as much on other things. Do we retain people? Do we promote people as a function of diversity, right? And I think we have to look at that entire pipeline. Like, sometimes we end up hiring diverse people, but, I, you know, uh, our, our work culture or work systems aren't set up to make those diverse people feel at home. And I think that's the other thing we need to work on as well. Thank you. Uh, hello, so, sir. Uh, this is Saurav. Uh, yep. I just want to put one question uh, in your yep. study. Uh, just wanted to know whether personality uh, can, as a type, can, uh, it can be a factor in you know retirement planning was any of that sort came into your research so uh, we didn't and uh, data part of it yeah so we we didn't do yeah. that in this study just because you know since it was a uh, randomized controlled trial we had no opportunity to actually collect data on things like personality we've done that with a bank here in canada where we do find strong correlations between personality and not so much on retirement decisions as much as communication preferences, right? Like, so market goes down, uh, advisor has to decide whether to call all of the clients or not. Uh, don't call all of them, just call the ones who are reactive, right? Because those are the ones who are likely to be impulsive and make, make a decision, right? So I think personality helps us better understand how to communicate with clients, how to, package messages differently. Uh, but we haven't seen any evidence of personality overall changing retirement uh, pension decisions. Karima? 
okay. okay sir thank you so i had this question uh, in long term research context can change over time so it might affect our research so what can we do to control this time effect um i think there are a couple of things to keep in mind one is as long as you have a science of how the context changes your outcome that's fine right so for example um my own thesis research back from 1995 i cannot replicate anymore it doesn't work right and the reason it doesn't work is my thesis was about how people value time in 1995 pre smartphone pre internet pre mobile when i had to wait for service it was a cost right so gary becker wrote this paper about the cost of time right uh, today time is not a cost people are waiting in line they can pay their bills they can do their studies they can speak with people right uh, so i think as long as you define your research at the right construct level and say here's the implicit assumptions i'm calling time a cost because it actually competes with other things i could do once you take that competition away it's no longer a cost uh then then your theorizing accounts for the fact that that context will change right so that's just one example but i think the bottom line is define your constructs uh to be as context free as possible uh and and that way you can accommodate changes in context and predict how those changes will change your results thank you sir preacher uh hello sir so sir i wanted to ask you one question actually for all the varying factors and moderating factors do you think experience sampling uh, will be a good measure to validate a uh, choice architecture the point is i have just finished my thesis and i have used experience sampling as a measure and it accommodates across uh, various age groups so and I, i'm studying cognitive aging and emotion regulation so i could accommodate personality factors socio cultural factors psychosocial factors and various other factors economic educational everything so hopefully yeah. uh, soon uh, uh, publication will be out from this work so i want to know whether uh, in the current time uh, the experience sampling as a measure is the need of the r as a lab longitude and uh, yeah so so i think the short answer is yes uh, i don't think we've seen enough of that there, there's yeah. some researchers now who have begun to do it especially in the area of financial wellbeing uh, but i think we can do a lot more i think you're absolutely right i think it gives us access to data sets that are uh, not not just different in terms of having different variables but also it's a time series of uh, of, of snapshots i think one, one of our biggest problem Uh, to also get back to the questions that were raised earlier is uh, the way we do research in our labs at this point in time it's a snapshot right like we don't know what baggage people bring into the lab we don't know what how it's going to change their decisions afterwards so so i think experience sampling is a fantastic uh, phenomena but i think more generally anything that allows us to track people over time i think in general is good and i think that's where i like to see more of a convergence between data science and behavioral science right we've always treated these things independently i don't know about iim but in our phd programs for example if you specialize in the behavioral sciences you just learn experiments yeah right you don't learn machine learning you don't learn, yeah you, you know you you're not encouraged to do econometric modeling uh, which i think is a bit of a mistake i think you know met- methods kind of now do exist that allow us to address some of these limitations so yeah absolutely experience sampling thumbs up right so i'd actually love to hear a bit more about your stuff so send me a paper when sure. you have it and sure. I'd, sure. i'd be happy to chat more about it sure thank you so is there anyone else so if not uh thank you professor soman for staying back uh Maybe just one observation before I leave. Uh, uh, I hope I'm not eating too much into your time. But, oh no, uh, please go ahead. So uh, I was reminded of the Lucas critique when you spoke about um, the intervention, and uh, similar to that, I think is it important to spend a really really long time choosing your in- independent variables? I guess. Uh, Uh, like you said to be as context free as possible and yeah. similar to that again 
that would be difficult. <laughs> no, you're right. So, so I think there is always going to be a tension between uh, doing applied work with the goal of improving welfare versus doing theoretical work yes. with the goal of understanding how the world works. I think that that tension is inherent in the work, uh, in the work that I spoke about. Uh, I think all of us have different ways of dealing with it. I think some of us tend to choose to go to one extreme or the other. Mine has been sort of more of a hybrid approach, which is a lot of what I showed you today, we've done lab testing where we've got the right constructs and we can create in the lab uh, you know, instantiations of how that context-free intervention uh, can work. But then we also take it to the field to say, okay, you know, in Mexico, we can use this to help uh, increase pension rates. So I think that's the way, that's my approach, but I think you, you raise an interesting tension. I think it goes also to discussions we've been having about sort of what's our purpose more generally as, as researchers. And, you know, one of the things that I'm, A always taught me was you do things to help people. Uh, and, and not just because, you know, because there are problems waiting to be solved. So I think I always came in with that lens uh, into my own PhD. Uh, so that's what's driven my work in this area. But it's a, it's a great observation. Actually, uh, one, one last one. Then I'm, uh, in one of your studies, uh, you spoke about, you know, uh, in the Mexico study where the, with the, I think the poor company people showed lesser interest. Correct. Well, I, I, I'm wondering that... Uh, uh, I was reminded of uh, great chess players. Uh, they became great because they focused on the games they lost. Yes. Uh, to learn. And I was wondering if uh, this one place where outlier analysis would probably be interesting to identify. Who are these people who focused on, uh, uh, I, I mean, among the, yeah. yeah, I mean, so they would be potentially uh, uh, great people in the future. I don't know. I, I, I agree. And I, I, I think more generally, I think the comment I would make is in our research, not just the stuff I presented today, but the field as a whole, we tend to focus on the effect of interventions on shifts in averages. Uh, we don't look at distributions as much. Right. Okay. And, 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 I, and I think there's an interesting sort of, um, you know, piece of research that I've been working on that hasn't made much progress, but that's because it's just hard to do where we look at, this is uh, you know, born out of my interest in, in cricket uh, and, and tennis, right? Uh, where the question is, if I'm training someone to serve in tennis or to bowl in cricket, how often should I give them feedback, right? Uh, so should I give them feedback at the end of every serve or at the end of every ball that they bowl, or should I wait for 10 overs or you know, 10 sets and give them feedback on it? And it turns out what we find, again, don't quote me on this because, you know, it's really hard to control this stuff. But we find that if you give people feedback frequently, they are consistent. The average is still the same. If you give uh -huh. them feedback infrequently, same average, but there are some brilliant things and some really terrible uh -huh. stuff. Right. And, and so it goes back. So, so that's an example of where the distribution changes, the, the means pretty much stay unaffected. Right. Um, but it kind of depends. Right. So in tennis, you can win Wimbledon if you get half your serves wrong. So it's what we call a forgiving environment. Right. Um, and so if the environment is forgiving, then in fact, having that flatter distribution might be the right thing, because what counts are the brilliant things. Uh, but again, like, you know, to your more general point, you're right. I mean, I don't think, you know, the field as a whole does that understanding of distribution and what are the outliers and you know, where, where those differences are coming very well. Right? So, uh, anyone else has something to say? In which case, just nothing, then um, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, my, my pleasure. And you have my email. So anyone has any follow-up questions, please do feel free to 